Um, I'm, I'm really honored to be here today representing Bob Moog's legacy, both in my role as the executive director of the Bob Moog Foundation and as Bob Moog's daughter. I'd like to talk about that latter part just for a minute and touch on something a little personal because I think it will help you understand the context of the rest of my comments. And that is, to me, my dad and Bob Moog are two different people. My dad was a serious, quiet, geeky, cool, humble guy. He was my voice of reason and my wisdom. He was my rock. He was my dad just like your dad is your dad. He um, was so humble that he held his career at arm's length from the family. So we knew of his accomplishments, but um, they were never talked about very much. And I don't think anyone in our family had a true sense of the impact that he had on the rest of the world. Well, that all changed in August of 2005 when my father died of a brain tumor. And while the black cloud of death certainly uh, was devastating. It did have a thick and beautiful silver lining. That lining was made up of the tens of thousands of people who reached out to our family and the thousands who left tributes on a website that we had set up for him. And they weren't just tributes of, we're sorry to have lost someone like Bob. They were tributes of Bob Moog changed my life. He transformed my creativity through his instruments and the music that they created. It was at that point that my family and I realized that Bob Moog, who is different from my dad, Bob Moog had a legacy of inspiration that deserved to be carried forward. That's when the foundation was created. And it's that very ethos of inspiration, the power of inspiration, that guides my own work and is the source of my comments here today. So we're going to talk about Bob Moog's arc of sonic discovery and his points of inspiration and how that's carried forward through some of the work that we're doing with the foundation. So let's talk about who, who is this guy, Bob Moog. Bob Moog in, was an electronic music pioneer who invented the Moog synthesizer in 1964. And in so doing, revolutionized the face of music. <clears throat> this music and the, mu and the instruments that he created, as I've said, had affected people all over the world. You have to wonder, for someone who's so massively accomplished, where did he get his start? What was his spark? What was his inspiration? When Bob was just a young teenager, he began building electronic hobbyist projects in the basement with his father. They would build Geiger counters, one note organs, theremins, and many other small devices. And by the time Bob was 14, he built his own full theremin on his own. He became so proficient at building theremins, and I should just back up for those of you who don't know uh, what a theremin is. A theremin is an early electronic musical instrument invented in 1919 by Leon Theremin, who was a Russian physicist. And you play the theremin without touching it. There's actually one in the room over there if you want to play it after the break. So Bob was fascinated with this instrument, and he started um, building them at 14. And by 19, he wrote his first article on the theremin and subsequently launched his first business, R.A. Moog Co., out of the basement of his parents' house. And Bob was guided by Leon Theremin's ethos of elegant design and high expressivity. He carried that with him as a young man and until really the day he died. It was, in fact, the Theremin, the first spark of Bob's inspiration, the first point in his arc, that led him to his pioneering work in synthesis. When Bob was about 30 years old, and he was running his theremin company, um, building kits and theremins, he met a young professor and experimental jazz musician and composer named Herb Deutsch. Herb Deutsch had one of his theremins and approached Bob and said, you know, there are these sounds I want to make, and I can't make them. I cannot find the technology to make them. They're in my head, but I can't produce them. I wonder if you would 
work with me to create an instrument that makes new sounds. Bob was intrigued by the idea. He later visited Herb in New York City, where, Bob, where Herb exposed him to the electronic music scene there. And in the summer of 1964, they spent three weeks working together in Trumansburg, New York, in the basement of Bob's house. And it was a process of Bob designing circuits, Herb testing them out and saying, you know, I need a little bit more of this, I need this different, and Bob would change it until they got it right. Well, at the end of those three weeks, Bob tells a story that he left Herb in the basement. And as he was coming back down to check on him, he heard music. And he was absolutely astounded at the musicianship and the sounds, the music that were coming from these very primitive designs that he had left Herb with. This is a really pivotal point, not only in Bob Moog's legacy, but in the history of electronic music. There's Herb being inspired by Bob's designs and Bob in turn being inspired by the music, by the sonic exploration that Herb was able to fulfill with something that was then relatively simple. That interaction, that dynamic would guide the rest of Bob's life. The musicians were his muse, he considered himself a tool maker, and he was building tools for these expressive people to, to, to have a voice, to have a musical voice. Now it took a little while, it took a few years, but synthesis gradually made its way into popular music. And you'll have to remember that back then this was a whole new sonic palette that people were exploring and hearing for the first time. I'm going to play a little clip of Strange Days from The Doors. This is from 1967, very early on. And you'll hear that the Moog synthesizer at this point is still being used as a sound effect, not a true musical instrument, but as a sound effect. You'll hear when Jim Morrison sings, Strange Days Are Upon Us, you have to listen carefully, there's a very subtle use of the synthesizer as as a sound effect. So. I don't know if you guys were able to catch that. It was a little hard for me to hear, but behind every word, there was just this very subtle kind of watery sound, and that was the first introduction of synthesized sound into popular music. And what's important about this is this is the beginning of the public consciousness being inspired by a whole new palette of sounds. Another example of that is the Beatles' uh, Maxwell Silver Hammer. And you'll hear right at the end of this clip that the synthesizer begins being used in a little bit more melodic form, but still in a very subtle way. So people are kind of feeling their way through this new world, through this new sonic landscape. That all changed in 1968 when the Moog synthesizer became launched as a musical instrument. In the fall of 1968, Bob presented a talk about multi-track recording at the Audio Engineering Society convention in New York City. And at the end of the talk, he was able to share an early mix um, of a recording, later known as Switched On Bach by Wendy Carlos with the audience, and he tells the story of walking to the back of the room, playing a clip, and watching Jaws drop. As brand new sounds are used in musically expressive and technically innovative ways. And I'm gonna play a, a clip for you um, so that you can hear the contrast in the way the synthesizer was used early and then used by Wendy. Remember, this is all Moog synthesizer.
figure that out in a second. But the point of Switched on Bach is talk about a point of inspiration. This recording blew the sonic landscape wide open, not only for musicians, but for music lovers and really for people all over the world. And all kinds of musicians were, were inspired um, and took their inspiration to, to affect their own creativity. Okay, I'm gonna play one more example of, you know, I was reminded of uh, Ashley's comments earlier about um, how science should be cool, sexy, fun, and interesting. And this next clip is um, an example of how Moog not only, you know, synthesis and the Moog sound not only became an inspiration in popular music, but then became synonymous with cool. And I'm probably not gonna play the whole thing because I see I'm running out of time, but I wanted to um, at least share part of it. I think you'll get a real kick out of it. This is a Schaefer beer commercial from about 1972. Uh-oh, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna move forward, but at the end it says, Schaefer, the beer to have when you're having more than one. <laughs> so, you know, here we are, we've traced Bob from the theremin all the way to his instruments becoming ubiquitous with everything cool and interesting in society. Bob and his team of engineers soon realized that they needed to take the large synthesizers that you saw in that commercial and in other slides and behind Bob there and condense it into a more portable and musically accessible instrument into the Mini Moog, um, which was subsequently used by loads of musicians. There are about 12,000 Mini Moogs floating around. Um, and it ha continued the transformation of the sonic landscape that we all know so well now, but then it was all brand new. And again, this is musicians to the music to the music lover. The inspiration goes all the way down that line. Um, and the Mini Moog was used by Keith Emerson, Rick Wakeman, Jan Hammer, Chick Corea, Herbie Hancock, Stevie Wonder, and the list just goes on and on. It's the inspiration that these instruments created, that Bob created, that the Bob Moog Foundation is carrying forward. This inspiration is such an incredible force for change, for learning, that we have grabbed it and we are taking it to affect future generations. We recently spent some time at Claxton Elementary bringing our Dr. Bob Sound School. And I wanted to show you a clip from that and I'll point out right at the very beginning that is, it is such a joy for me to welcome Bob Moog into the room with us. The first thing you'll hear on this clip is Bob Moog's voice. Greetings to all of you uh, from me. It's two days later now, Herb, and a uh, rather spectacular development has happened. Doesn't sound like much when I play it. Maybe with someone with uh, more musicianship and imagination can get some good things out of it. Dr. Bob Sound School is our educational outreach program. And in this program, our goal is to teach kids essentially about the science of sound through the magic of music. The way the kids light up when they are able to sculpt the sound on their own is it's really just magical. Our feeling is that this program is not just to encourage more musicians or scientists or engineers, but to create more creative politicians, businessmen, journalists, etc., etc. More creativity is what we are going to need to be able to conquer the challenges that are before us. 
So the point of that isn't really to promote the Bob Moog Foundation, but to show you the power of inspiration, the, the, the way those kids' faces light up, the way that they're engaged. That's the power of what we're doing. We're carrying the initial spark of Bob Moog's early work with theremins right to children of today and tomorrow. And the, the, the crux of this whole legacy of Bob Moog's legacy is that inspiration is powerful, it's a force for change, and it's our hope for solving tomorrow's problems. And in closing, I would like to say, I hope that you will go forth and inspire other people. It's what we're all here for. And that you will open yourself up to being inspired because the world depends on it. And I would just like to say thank you to Bob Moog for leaving us an indelible legacy of inspiration that we can all enjoy. Thank you very much.